guest today is Professor Sophie Bjork James, a, a PhD, an anthropologist, an assistant professor of the practice, anthropology department of Vanderbilt University, uh, author of the new book, The Divine Institution, White Evangelicalism's Politics of the Family. Uh, she's also the co-editor of Beyond Populism, Angry Politics in the Twilight of Neoliberalism. Uh, website is Sophie Bjork James, S-O-P-H-I-E, B-J-O-R-K-J-A-M-E-S dot com, and S. Bjork James is her Twitter handle. And uh, Professor Bjork James, welcome to the program, and thank you for joining us, and thank you for writing this brilliant book. I'm, I'm very pleased to have you with us. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really happy to be here. I, I, I'm, I'm fascinated by uh, the, the rise of white evangelicalism and Let's let's begin by defining terms because this is a relatively recent phenomenon. In your book, you you in some ways kind of track it back to the 1940s, and uh, but point to other milestones. Exactly, how do you define um, uh, you know the subject of your book, white evangelical evangelicalism? Yeah, and this is a it's it's a complicated uh, question because we define it in different ways, like uh, different groups define it in different ways. So the theological definition of evangelicalism is people who, Christians who identify as being born again, prioritize evangelizing, and see the Bible as either literal or, um, you know, like a key source um, that shouldn't be contested. Uh, so that's the theological uh, definition. However, when we use it in, like when it's used in um, po politics and when it's used by the press, uh, often they really, when, they, when evangelicals are referred to, they actually mean white evangelicals because if we look at just the theological definition, most African-American Christians fit that definition but don't identify as evangelical because they, see, they tend to see evangelicalism as about politics and often about whiteness. Uh, or even racism, and so don't I, most African American Christians don't identify as evangelical, and so when it's used theologically, right, it's about this series of this kind of combination of beliefs. But when it's used by the press and in politics, it's used to explain a particular religious movement that is vastly majority white uh, and also holds. A, this, this combination of theological beliefs. Um, and that's what I, really, I try to highlight in the book, is that we can't think about this religious movement outside of being also a racial movement. And, and to what extent did this grow out of things, or at least the, the strength and popularity of it, um, grow out of things like the Brown v. Board decision in 1954? and the movement for racial justice, uh, you know, that really uh, began in a, in a big way in the United States. I mean, it, it had been going back all the way to the, to the founding of the Republic in the, in the abolition movement and whatnot, but uh, particularly after, during and after World War II. Yeah, so if, if we think back to the 1970s, the conservative political movement in the United States is pretty much in a shambles, right? The, kind of segregation forever uh, politicians had all lost. They all knew that they couldn't gain a national platform, much less a regional platform, being overtly racist. Uh, there was a history of economic elitism, but it wasn't really growing in, in influence. Uh, and so what you had is a series of uh, politically savvy um, activists and advocates who saw in white evangelicalism the possibility of a political movement. So before the late 1970s, white evangelicals were a pretty diverse uh, religious movement. Right? It was really about these theological definitions of being born again and evangelizing and you know, seeing the Bible as literal or at least like the center of one's um, kind of intellectual life. Uh, and right, t Jimmy Carter was the first evangelical who elected into the presidency, uh, representing a very liberal evangelical tradition. Uh, but it was really in defending segregation that first formed white evangelicals into a political movement. So after Brown v. Board of Education, 
uh, hundreds of private Christian schools were formed across the southern United States, across um, the whole United States, but concentrated in the South uh, as a way of allowing for the continuation of segregated schools in that they were um, de facto segregated. So under Carter, uh, he directed the IRS to start uh, making those schools prove that they were uh, desegregated in fact and not just in principle. And so the IRS started to threaten these schools for losing their tax-exempt status if they couldn't prove that they were desegregating. And that forms a national movement, um, primarily across the South, um, but there was a number of organizations fighting fighting this legislation, or fighting um, this, this IRS tactic, uh, and they were very successful, and they really mobilized um, groups all across the South, and out of, after they um, started to see significant successes uh, in those act- activities, Jerry Falwell uh, kind of helped to shift the framework away from defending our private Christian schools to defending Christian culture, uh, which was de facto white Christian culture, from this new boogeyman of secular liberalism. Uh, the moral majority was formed out of the, the, these um, pro-segregation chapters, and that was really the emergence of the national religious right. Uh, so. I argue that historically we can't understand the contemporary religious right as anything other than really a kind of response to the successes of the African American Christian led uh, civil rights movement. Yeah, and 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 the movement to integrate our schools and and our churches and and you know just American life in general. Um, it, it, tell me about this guy. I, I'm, I'm going to play a clip here. Um, let me make sure I've got the right one. Yeah, here it is. Uh, this is Paul Weyrick, if I'm pronouncing his name right. This is in 1980. He's in a church basement in, in Dallas, Texas, talking to a group of evangelicals uh, who are Republican activists. He's, he's a co-founder of the Heritage Foundation. He's working on the Reagan campaign when he gives this speech. And here he is. Now, many of our Christians have what I call the goo-goo syndrome, good government. They want everybody to vote. I don't want everybody to vote. Elections are not won by a majority of people. They never have been from the beginning of our country, and they are not now. As a matter of fact, our leverage in the elections quite candidly goes up as the voting populace goes down. Now, he he shows up in your book. Tell us about this. Yeah, and I mean, what a what an appropriate uh, clip to be thinking about right now. Uh, so Paul Eric is, is is known as one of one of the architects of the religious right. He was uh, had this vision for creating a new base for the conservative movement in within white evangelicalism, uh, and really helped to mobilize Jerry Falwell, who became the first national leader of the religious right, who remained really significant uh, for decades. Um, uh, so Weyrich's vision was both in terms of founding the Heritage Foundation, in terms of being central to the moral majority, was to mobilize Christ, uh, white evangelical Christians uh, to form the base of the Republican Party. Uh, and as the clip showed, right, he had a very authoritarian view of politics. Right, in terms of wanting limited government, but also was very clear about not supporting like an expansive multiracial democracy. It was very okay with limiting limiting democracy as well. Right. And and to you you in the book you talk about traveling to Colorado Springs and your experience there. In fact, it's a very personal book. We're talking with Sophie Bjork James, uh, who wrote The Divine Institution, this new book, White Evangelicalism, I, I, I always mangle this word, Evangelicalism's Politics of the Family. Um, uh, tell us about Colorado Springs and why, why there. Yeah, so I don't have any personal connection to Colorado Springs. I was very interested in studying this, this, this question that I, I still I found very intriguing, which is like what allows for the very broad spread political agreement within white evangelicalism. 
you know, the, I was attending churches in different parts of the country and listening to Christian radio. And, you know, what I found is that in terms of churches, there was, there were, most church sermons are not very overtly political in terms of most pastors aren't telling, I mean, some do, but most don't say, you know, who you should vote for or will, most won't rail against the homosexual agenda, et cetera. Um, but white evangelicals have been voting as a block pretty much since the late 1970s, right? About 80% uh, of white evangelicals vote for the Republican candidate in each election. Um, that went up slightly uh, in, uh, in terms of support for Trump. So I was really interested in what allowed for that political agreement. Uh, so Colorado Springs had is known kind of tongue-in-cheek as the Evangelical Vatican, um, starting... In the 90s, it attracted uh, at one point over 100 evangelical organizations, uh, there, including Focus on the Family, which is uh, the most significant white evangelical institution. Uh, it has it's, it has such a dominant place in Colorado Springs. It has its own uh, marker on the freeway saying where the exit is. It um, received at one point so much mail it had its own zip code. Because uh, Christians would write in from all over the world asking for advice on wow. families, um, and it's just very central. It's so James several, Dobson, right? Right, James Dobson founded it, and then he he retired about ten years ago, and then started a different family ministry that's also in Colorado Springs. Um, but yeah, there's there's several large churches of between you know over seven thousand members, uh, and so it's a highly concentrated space for studying white evangelicalism. A lot of the people that I got to know through my research would talk about the, living in the a Christian bubble where almost everyone that they spent time with. So Sophie, when you went to Colorado Springs, would you just like show up, here I am? I mean, uh, tell us about the experience. Yeah, I mean, I was nervous. I was a, a graduate student coming from New York City. I am not a Christian myself and was very clear with everyone that I wasn't. And so I was really expecting, you know, a lot of prejudice or, you know, concern about me. And I was actually really welcomed into the community. I just started emailing pastors and, you know, Bible study leaders, uh, you know, most of these large churches, even if there's 12,000 members, you know, most uh, people participate in these um, Bible study groups, which can be organized around anything from motorcycle enthusiasts, you know, to uh, gardeners, hiking groups, uh, uh, all around, you know, studying the Bible or talking about the Bible, but also doing activities that individuals enjoy. So I just started emailing um, and calling, uh, you know, Bible study leaders and pastors and um, you know, was pretty immediately um, found myself in a pretty broad community of, of folks attending Bible. I attended about 10 different uh, Bible study groups throughout my year of research there, um, interviewed around 100 evangelicals. So uh, everyone from, uh, you know, youth pastors, senior pastors, women's pastors, everyday, everyday Christians, um, media, and media producers. Um, so it was a pretty, I got a pretty broad, broad glimpse about um, the kind of evangelical world in Colorado. If, if you don't mind my asking, are, are you Jewish? Because there's a huge contingent of evangelicals who are literally focused on converting Jews to Christianity. I am not Jewish. Okay. I am unaffiliated. But okay. yes, there is the, um, there's a large church in Colorado Springs that, yeah, prioritizes evangelizing to Jews. Uh, you know, a lot of evangelicals believe that, you know, Jews are God's chosen people and that God wants them to now convert to Christianity. So, but no, I was unaffiliated. And so that in, in some ways I was a blank slate. So a lot of people really hoped that I would convert and got, ups, you know, slightly upset as the year, as the year went on and I did not. To Christianity or to evangelical Christianity? Oh, yes. Or both? I, they, both. So did you present yourself as, uh, you know, I'm an anthropologist, I look at how cultures work, and I'm here to study yours? Yep, yep, pretty much. And, you know, I mean, it's, it's complicated when you are not a Christian and studying evangelicals, because they always see uh, your presence as a chance to try to convert you, mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, see that as, you know, like I would have people say things like, well, I'm sure God brought you, 
uh, you know, to me <laughs> for a mm-hmm. reason. Um, and so it's the, you know, they the, um, really work hard at trying to see everything through this religious lens. Um, everything from one's food choices, one's exercise habits, who one spends time with, um, and how one votes. Um, you know, I think we, when we think about when evangelicals are represented politically um, and, and in the press, we often are just, you know, see them as political actors. And, you know, what I, what, what was very clear through my research is that, you know, they adopt this, you know, religious view. And uh, Sophie, so you, you, you go to Colorado Springs, you, you meet with over a hundred of these uh, evangelical groups and, and Bible study groups and hang out with them. You're right up front with them that you're, you're not a Christian, you're unaffiliated in any way with any religion or church. Um, you are an anthropologist and, and you're here to essentially study them. Uh, many of them respond to you as if, uh, oh, God must have brought this person to me. Fresh meat, basically. Um, w- how would you best describe the worldview as an anthropologist of the people that, that you were meeting, that you were, that you were studying, as it were, when you were there? Yeah, I mean, I, my experience was that in, people individually were incredibly kind and that there was a huge ethic in terms of, you know, embracing, uh, you know, and being kind to anyone who you meet. And I definitely experienced that in terms of people's generosity towards me. But I also really came to see that a uh, hierarchy is incredibly important in that worldview. Uh, and so my, my interest was in looking at what allows for this, you know, really significant political unity within white evangelicalism. And what I, what I found is that an emphasis on the nuclear family, on, you know, a, a father, a wife, and children is kind of the cornerstone of their entire theology. Um, so it's the center of their kind of lived lived experience. So many churches will organize Bible studies based on whether you're a young young adult or you're married or you're an empty nester, right? And so it's organized based on how you fit into the nuclear family. Um, and, you know, I came to see like almost every sermon, uh, it's the, there's some, there's some evangelical feminists that want to have women ordained as ministers uh, in practice, that's incredibly rare. So all of the main pastors, all the elders and overseers, like everyone in positions of authority in these churches are men. You know, there could be women overseeing a women's or children's ministry, uh, but it's all the positions of authority are men. And most of the pastors, when they preach on Sunday mornings or Wednesday evenings or Thursday evenings, there's a lot of, there's a lot of preaching and that happens in these churches, but most will you know, bring in stories about, you know, a fight they got in with their wife or mother-in-law at the Walmart parking lot as a way to kind of make the Bible make sense. But right. it reinforces the importance of this nuclear family.